Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful way to start this service. This is the fifth Sunday of January, and uh, in this most traditional of churches, we'll have a non-traditional service today. Um, we're going to start with our announcements. If you want to look at the inside cover of your bulletin, you see that our altar flowers are placed by Ron Permenter in honor and memory of Donnie Dewerson's mother, Grace Dewerson. Her birthday was the, is today, 31st of January. Our church conference was last Sunday. It was well attended. Thank uh, all of you who made it well attended. It was a productive time. And again, we reiterate that each and every one of you are invited to participate in any of the many, many ways that there are to contribute to the life of this church and our work in this community. If you have any questions about that, please contact the church office. We'll have information on our website pretty soon with a lot of details um, about um, tasks, large and small, that uh, you might be able to participate in. We're going to have a hymn sing um, today. That'll be a fun time. At 6 o'clock tonight, we have a special um, occasion also. Wells, um, some members of Wells, uh, received a grant to uh, do an oral history project. And there'll be a presentation tonight about the oral history project. Um, Betty Quinn, John Garner, Jackie McGinnis, and Keith Tonkel uh, uh, will be here tonight to talk about that. Do you want to say more about that, Jim? Yeah, I just want you to, to encourage everybody to come. It's really mm -hmm. interesting what we've been discovering since last year about the, the, the history of the church. I mean, little things like we were the first church to have uh, a kitchen in Mississippi, from what I understand. Kitchen? I mean, and it's the same one still there. <laughs> Thank you, James. Here in the sanctuary and eat before you come or eat after because there's no food. Right? No yes. food. Okay. Well, except for the soul. Yeah. Uh, this past Monday, at the invitation of Keith Ferguson and Mark Fields, Keith was presented um, to the Jackson Rotary Club as a Phyllis, uh, Phil Harris. Okay, it's Paul Harris, okay, Paul Harris Fellow, um, and as a result of that, um, Keith will be able to donate $1,000 to a local charity, um, so that's a nice thing. We'll be publishing our annual rent Lenten Reflections collection. Today's the last day to submit that. 200 words, that'll just about fit on a couple of pew cards. Please, unless you're truly inspired, don't write that during John's sermon. No, please do write during the okay. um, David Hampton is admiring God's beauty this morning from the deer stand. Uh, Jane Everly attends the early service and is not here. But um, as of Friday, we only had seven that had been submitted. So we need 39 by tomorrow. Oh. So uh, if you would, please get to writing. It won't take that very long to sit down and write 200 words and write a prayer. But these things mean quite a lot um, to the whole congregation. And so
So if you feel so inclined, please write one. And even if you don't, write something anyway and submit it. Yeah. David's a consummate editor, so no matter what you put together, he'll be able to turn it into something decent. So. Keith, do you want to say a couple of words? I want to start by saying I continue to believe in the miraculous, and we're going to get the Lenten booklet done today. So just write it and send it in. You can do it by email or however. Um, I used to have a Korean friend when I was in college, and he always taught me Korean sayings. I actually learned this one in Korean. I can't say it anymore like that. But it goes like this. The taller the bamboo grows, the lower it bends. And I uh, just want you to know that this morning I feel so humbled by your love and by your prayers. Um, the diagnosis last week was not what we wanted. Uh, it is squamous cell carcinoma. It's right there. Um, the good thing is my doctor called even yesterday morning to say that, um, and for her to call at the early morning hour, that she was excited because she feels that it's treatable and that we can beat it. And so continue in your prayers. And the reason I say the word of humility, I just can't believe how kind and loving and compassionate you all are in your prayers, in your understanding that I can't do my workload quite the way I wanted to do it before. But one of the things that really touched me a lot this morning was we were checking out the Facebook thing and we found out that the Parkway Hills Methodist Church took a group uh, to worship with the Jewish community on Friday night, and the first prayer prayed was for me. Um, and, and God is good, and God is good through us all. And so I just wanted to make my little statement. Uh, I'm here. I'm going to fight it. Um, we're going to do well. I, I don't expect uh, to be out much or long. At the present time, we have an appointment at MD Anderson uh, with a surgeon who's famous for this particular type surgery on the 17th of the month. So may I have a little prayer? Let's have a little prayer. Our Father, we're talking about the preacher right now. But the truth is that each of us are equally precious and equally important in your sight. And to know that you have loved us and that in grace you have received us to yourself is so important. Now, more than ever, God, in times like these, help us to love one another as you in Christ have loved us. Amen. It looks like our call to worship is after the opening sentences, right? This time. This time, okay. If you please stand, let's join in the opening sentences. With powerful words and dramatic gestures, with a quiet conversation and a gentle touch, we respond to God's call to offer healing and hope to our world. With the courage to face the injustices around us, with the willingness to go into the brokenness, we fulfill the call of Jesus to engage in faithful obedience. Please join me in the prayer. Dear God, Help us to become the Spirit's refuge for all who live in worry and fear. Amen. You may be seated. So things are going to be a little different today. And be ready for anything. It's kind of like that day Fridays on the Mickey Mouse Club, if you remember. <laughs>
So who's got a hair? Trissy.
another one before I came up here. If you will, stand and turn to page 69. And while you're standing, I just, I have to acknowledge the musicians because um, I don't know Margaret's background very much, but I do know that Jamie grew up in the Baptist church and she probably can play any hymn there is in the book without even looking at it. So thank Presbyterian. Presbyterian. She was a frozen chosen, so there's only <laughs> only a few, you know, and it was all about predestined. So but uh, but we're we, we're glad y'all were predestined to be with us today. If you choose to and would like to follow along together uh, as we recite in unison for true singing. Glorious God, source of joy and righteousness, enable us as redeemed and forgiven children evermore to rejoice in singing your praises. Grant that we sing with our lips, we may believe with our hearts. And when we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives, so that being doers of the word and not hearers only, 
we may receive the everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So as Keith has his uh, uh, epiphany during the season of epiphany, to do this, um, we gathered at his house, James and I did this past week, to talk about the service and to try to understand you know, where we wanted to go. Um, if, you did, if you don't listen to our YouTube services, I encourage you to do that. Jane usually has them up by noon on Mondays. Keith's message this morning was incredibly um, to the point and had some excellent things, so I encourage you to listen to that. I offered him to preach today, and he said, no, you've prepared. I'll give a little tidbit, and then you can, you can do your thing. So I'm going to do my thing now. Um, so if you will, look at the back of your order of service at this calling of Jeremiah. It's from the message. If you're not familiar with Eugene Peterson's uh, version or translation of the Bible, I encourage you to find one somewhere because he puts it in language that, that makes it more readable, more understanding, especially um, in our society today. But this is the calling of Jeremiah, and, um, and, and we're not going to have the song, The Time Has Come Today, but the time has come today where the calling is real and true. So listen to these words. The message of Jeremiah, son of Hekiah, of the family of priests who live in Anathoth, in the country of Benjamin. God's message began to come to him during the 13th year of Josiah, son of Amos's reign in Judah. I know that means a lot to you, but while I'm taking intro to Old Testament for the third time, I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> it continued to come to Judah and to come to him during the time of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, who reigned over Judah. And it continued to come to him clear down to the fifth month of the eleventh year in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, over Judah, the year that Jerusalem was taken into exile. And this is what God said. Before I shaped you in the womb, I knew all about you. Before you saw the light of day, I had holy plans for you. A prophet to the nations, that's what I had in mind for you. But I said, <laughs> hold it, Master God. Look at me. I don't know anything. I'm only a boy. Now, just to pause right here for just a moment. He was probably 14 or 15. I don't know any 14 or 15-year-old boys that would respond that way. They would say, I already know it all. Thanks. Thanks be to God. But God told me, don't say I'm only a boy. I'll tell you where to go, and you'll go there. I'll tell you what to say, and you'll say it. Don't be afraid of a soul. I'll be right there looking after you. God's decree. God reached out and touched my mouth and said, look, I've just put my words in your mouth, hand delivered. See what I've done. I've given you a job to do among nations and governments. It's a red letter day. Your job is to pull up and tear down, take apart and demolish, and then start over, building and planning. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, I've always liked Jeremiah. He was slightly nuts which is what a prophet needs to be to, hear, to have the guts to carry the things that prophets had to do. He also used audio visuals, object lessons, and, and, and used them to a good effect. He threw around jars. He walked around naked. Notice I didn't say Louis Grizzard's naked. Naked. There's a difference. But you know that sort of thing. Jeremiah was a passionate person, and he was powerful in the way he accepted his call. There's no sense that God might have been looking for a prophet one day, and Jeremiah happened to walk by. 
The calling is something that God knew before he ever entered into the world. Jeremiah was chosen by God who knew him intimately before he ever breathed his first breath. And Jeremiah is just a teenager, you know. Probably not much older than Joseph or Mary were at the time of Jesus' birth. Most commentators say he was about 14 to 17 years old. And here's God telling him to go to these people and prophesy. I'll tell you a story in a minute. But to me, that's interesting. A beardless boy prophesying to the rulers of nation. Jeremiah was kind of like Stephen Martin. He was a wild and crazy guy. And not all he did was good. But he does it with such a passion and flair, you can't help believe that God is on the inside of him showing him what to do. I was visiting with one of our church members this week, Loy Moncrief, trying to figure out what to do with a yard that has a bunch of clay after a foundation problem. And, and as I was lamenting, I was also lamenting about the fact that I got my syllabus for my class that starts at Millsaps in April, and the syllabus looks like that of a full-time student, of which I've been, well, I have a bachelor's, a master's of religious education, a master's of divinity, and a doctorate of ministry, and now I'm going back to get another master's. <sighs> And I was talking to Loy about this, and he says, why do you have to do all this? I said, well, the Methodists don't recognize my ordination from the Baptist church. Because, you know, they, well, Baptists, you know, never mind. That's a whole other deal. <laughs> but Loy looked at me, and he said, where does ordination come from? I said, the bishop, I guess. He goes, No. Ordination comes from above. It comes from God. And I believe you're ordained. And we shared stories about that ordination. Jenny Owens has a song that says, I will do whatever you want me to. All you have to do is just show me. I read this this week as I was preparing for the sermon. Life cannot be against you. For you are life itself. Life can only seem to go against your ego's projections, which is rarely in harmony with the truth. In the spring of 1981, I was a high school senior. I was on a retreat during spring break at Gulf Shores Baptist Assembly. And as we had prepared to get on the bus, I was working in the recreation building for John Bewley at Broadmoor Baptist Church, the original, the one that's on North Side, not, well, never mind. And I uh, went on a youth retreat. I had been involved in Sunday school. My parents made me go to church. My brother being mentally handicapped, my parents alternated Sundays in which they would go to church, but I never got to alternate with them. I would say, well, let me stay home with joy today. No, you're going to Sunday school and church. And you're like, oh, okay. So we go to these places, and I really never learned how to hate in Sunday school, but later on I saw that some of the things I was taught was full of hate. But on this particular retreat, there was a young lady that got on the bus, and I leaned over to my buddy Andy Jordan. I said, who's that? He said, that's Leanne Mangum. And I went, I'm going to get to know her on this trip. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I made it my priority number one. I wasn't there to hear what God may say to me, even though one of my good friends, Wayne Osborne, was leading in the music and another guy was doing the messages. But we were at Gulf Shores and I was zeroed in on Leanne. 
But before the weekend was over, God had zeroed in on me. And I had made a rededication of my life to Christ. And as I got back home, and, and, you know, it's not how high you can jump, it's how you walk when you hit the ground kind of thing, when you, when you come back from camps, retreats, etc. And I remember trying to do the right thing. And I remember one Sunday, um, Sunday evening laying in bed, I was listening to uh, Bob Dylan's Slow Train Coming. And I thought, what can I do to make a difference in my school? because I was not really known as a very godly person at Manhattan High School. And uh, so I got up and shared my testimony. And that evening, uh, it was on a Wednesday, and I remember going to church that night, and Jerry Pounds, who was our youth minister at the time, was talking about the calling of Samuel and how God was calling Samuel, and, and the first time he went, to his mentor, the second time he went to his mentor, and the third time he went to his mentor, and his mentor said, say, here am I, Lord, what do you have for me? And I remember saying, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to be a minister. And I was like, well, (laughs) that's not going to happen. A couple days later, I talked with my dad. I said, you know, Dad, I really planned on going to Ole Miss, going to law school, and being an attorney, and doing all those kinds of things. And he goes, you know, well, maybe God has other plans for you. A few weeks later, I was sitting in the pew, and there was a missionary speaking. Raise your hand if you know how boring missionaries can be when they speak. (laughs) The rest of y'all are lying. (laughs) And, uh, And I was zoned in. I was listening, and I turned to the person sitting next to me, and I said, you know, I really feel God calling me to be a youth minister. And that person looked at me and said, you'd be great. And I went, okay. So I went and talked to John Bewley. I went and talked to David Grant. And I realized that maybe that's what God was calling me to do. And God knows I did not have the pedigree for being a minister at all. But there was something about that call that wouldn't let go. All through college, I tried to ignore it. Tried to run from it. Tried to do something different. And every time I did, there was always this tug that said, this is what you need to do. And I can't tell you enough how that calling and the people that I have reconnected with over the years I got a message this morning from Darla Miller who's a twin Darla and Carla from First Baptist Church Bartlesville Oklahoma saying what a blessing that Leanne and I had been on their lives notice notice she said Leanne and I you know because it's a partnership She's just as much of a minister as I have been. But I can't tell you how much that's blessed me. And so when I, when I was looking at the scripture today, I thought, you know, all this stuff that I've been through, all these callings that I've had, being unemployed for a few months, but then finding a place like Wells, where I can actually be myself and people laugh at you, but they don't ridicule you. You are who you are. And I think of how you guys have changed my life and accepted me, that my calling continues to be a minister. As much as that can be a pain on the south end of a northbound mule, at times it is what it is. So I want to give you these words this morning as I close. You are the hands preparing meals for the hungry. You are God's feet running to those who are suffering. You are God's light guiding people out of dark places. You are God's voice demanding justice for the oppressed. Through you, God speaks to the world Through the life you live and the sacrifices you make, God is present. 
like Jeremiah, God knew you and he loved you before you were formed. Like Jeremiah, you, each of you, are called to change the world. And like Jeremiah, you are a game changer for somebody. Love speaks in dance, in missions, in arts, in civil protest, in relationships, and God communicates in music. With you, each of you, God has a voice. I want you to do this with me real quick. I want you to state your name and say, with me, God has a voice. Ready? With John, God has a voice. Say it again, insert your name. With John, God has a voice. Each of you has a voice. So pause and ask, how is God speaking through you? Frank St. Saint- Francis of Assisi said one time, and I remember this forever and ever, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Here's a a, a closing statement. It's not a parting shot, by the way. I like weird people. I like the black sheep. I like the odd ducks. I like the rejects. I like the eccentrics. I like the loners. I like the lost and the forgotten. Because more often than not, these people have the most beautiful souls. And God calls them just as much as he calls all of us. I don't know where it came from. I read it one time, the first time I went to seminary. (laughs) God does not call the qualified. God qualifies the called. When I first decided that I was going into ministry, I was terrified that God would send me to Africa. I didn't want to be a missionary. It wasn't just Africa. I didn't want to go anywhere except maybe to Colorado where we could ski, you know. But I had John Bewley, who really is my my spiritual hero. He looked at me one day in his office and he said, John, I'll tell you this. God is not going to call you to do anything that he will not equip you to do before you go. So know this. Have faith, knowing that God can use you and will use you to bring heaven to earth. The call, I swear to you on the Bible, is not easy. There's nothing about it that's easy. And the journey is very challenging. And you will fail just as I have failed. But remember this. You are each capable of doing amazing things for the kingdom of God. Because that's how God made you. So don't bother with excuses. Because you're better than that. Instead, when you feel God calling you to do something, step up, rise up, and speak out. Because all of us have a dream. Thanks be to God. Join me as we pray. God, it's a pretty cool thing when you get a phone call, except from somebody you don't want to talk to. And then you hit the button that says, "Eh, maybe later. And then you may check your voicemail. 
And if you don't really like who's calling, you may not return the voicemail. But God, you call each of us. Landline, cell phone, satellite phone. You call us somehow, some way, every day. But most of the calling comes through our seeking you. Our dialing you up on the phone and saying, God, here I am. Send me. May we be sent the way you sent your son who taught us that heaven is available not just at death, not when our days on this earth are over, but heaven on this earth. The birth of a child, the smile of a loved one, the eyes that open of someone who may be suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's. But they smile. You call us for a pastor who in spite of constant struggles remains loving, caring, and sharing. Teach us to do the things that you've commanded us to do and the call that you have given us and help us to remember that as we pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I would like to request, Be Thou My Vision. I don't know the number.
I surrender all. I like that. Thank you. <laughs> Let me make a couple of statements. Number one thing is I kidded about Episcopalians. And John, from time to time, uh, shares his story uh, in his faith journey. We love all of God's children. And when we say something like that, it's never to put down. I just want you to know that. You know, it's just to simply acknowledge the fact that each of us uh, are finding God at work in different ways and through different places. Um, and God is not confined. And so that's important to me. The other thing is, we're going to do birthdays real quickly. We usually do that, and some people think it's crazy, but it's not to us because we celebrate the lives of those entrusted to us. And we're going to do communion very differently this morning. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if Jeff and his wife will uh, take the sacrament out to the bench outside at the close, and if anyone feels led to receive the sacrament, it's been consecrated and is ready for you. And we'd like to do that today because we offered it uh, at the earlier service and had promised that we would do it at this service as well. So, if our ushers will come at this time, we will receive your tithes and offerings. I'm looking for them. I do not see them. There they come. There they go. Oh, okay. Yes. There you are. Go ahead. Uh, listen, while they are doing that, you're all speaking of giving uh, on the uh, table out there where you have the sign-up book for guests. There are a list of duties that we're trying to get more people to take on. And if you look at it, it's something you're interested in. We'll tell you what it is, how to do it. You'll let us know if you want to do it for a week or a month or something like that. We want more of our own people, each one do one, uh, to be active and uh, feel like you got a vital part to play because this is one way of offering, but that's another way of offering too. So let's pray, please. Dear God, it's a special thing to be able to give a tithe or an offering because what we're doing is saying, here is a little piece of myself that you gave me in the first place, and I want to give it back to you. And God, I want to be sure that it's well used. Make that so, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
have a seat for just a minute. We have a little, I forgot to do birthday song. Oh, we said it. Very quickly, let's hear who's got a birthday. We're going to sing for you. And then we've got one more thing we've got to do before we go. So, yes. Okay, yes. All oh, right, yes, my love. Okay, okay, right, Jean. Okay, Rick. Okay, yes, sir. Oh, excellent. He was 12. All the way back. Okay, Ferg. Okay, Brenda. Okay, David, welcome home. Great. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, Chelsea and Olivia, February 3rd. Okay. Uh, my mother's week is Friday and has two co-workers. Okay, Uncle Ray. 82 last night. 82 last night. Okay, bless your heart in the balcony. Uh, Aaron was 11 on Thursday. Aaron 11 on Thursday. John. Okay. Is that, is, yeah, that's, yes, dear. Okay. Okay, bless you. Okay, right, right down here, and then we'll get, go ahead, young lady, here. Okay, we you eight? Okay, balcony. Okay, Margaret is tomorrow. This young lady, okay, yes, darling. My mother was on Thursday. Okay. And remember, we're going to be done eventually. And uh, Debbie and Jeff are going to have the communion for you out there. But now, see any other hands? Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you and keep you. Happy birthday to you. And before we leave, we're about to go. But this is an indulgence to me because I've been thick. And I want to do this. I want you to turn your hymnal to number 57. We're going to have fun. This is going to be interesting. Five, seven. <clears throat> Are you willing to do this again, James, baby? Yes. Okay, here's what I'm asking. I'm going to ask James by himself to sing verse 1. And I'm going to ask Jackie McGinnis to join him on verse 2. It'll be James. On verse 3 comes the choir. On verse 4 comes this side. Verse 5, the middle. Verse 6 here. And verse 7, all of us. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. Okay? And if it's not glorious, we'll still do it. Okay? Okay. You, you, uh, shall we stand or sit? What do you say? Let's stand. Let's stand. Okay. Here we go. Get ready. Here we go. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. Oh,
together. Okay, y'all, if you will, we're going to let Debbie and Jeff come now and take the sacrament. In just a minute, we'll get a hand. Let's let them come, and we'll sing our benediction. Okay, there they go. Okay, he's got the sacrament. Debbie, he said he'll meet you out front. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. Spencer's feeling a little weak there, so we're going to get with him in just a second. You okay, baby? Okay, let's do it. Let's sing.